Warning, this episode contains brain food that will lead to improved emotional and social intelligence. Thanks for tuning in to Harvesting Happiness today for a healthy serving of consciously prepared brain food. This is Lisa cypress Cayman, your host. For more than 13 years, I've been handcrafting these sound ideas for better well-being. Each week, I love spotlighting diverse thinkers and doers who are contemporary trendsetters and change agents devoting their lives to creating a better world in which to live. I invite you to listen up and change the way you think about human happiness. Our award-winning content is fresh, optimistic, and purpose-driven media that promotes well-being from the inside out. Alrighty then, let's dive in. This episode offers psychosocial education designed to inspire and motivate our listeners. The information provided does not constitute a therapeutic relationship nor a substitute for professional mental health care. If you are experiencing a mental health crisis, call 911, go to your nearest emergency room, or for listeners in the United States, text 988 for the National Suicide and Crisis Lifeline. Good morning, good afternoon, and good evening, wherever you are. Thanks for joining me on today's show, where we will be talking about what it means to be out of sorts and on the edge. My guest today is Dr. Meg Errol. She is a psychologist, scientist, and author specializing in health and well-being. Dr. Meg's solution-focused approach gives practical tips and strategies for life's tricky problems. She is usually based in London, where she is a regular contributor to BBC Radio, The Daily Mail, and more. Currently, Meg is based in the great state of Alabama, and she is the author of Tiny Traumas, When You Don't Know What's Wrong, But Nothing feels quite right. Welcome, Dr. Meg. Thanks for joining me on the show today. Oh, Lisa, I'm so happy and excited to be here. And thank you for that amazing intro. Oh, thanks. Well, that is all you. And I I should add, Dr. Meg has like a zillion credentials after her name, (laughs) but they're too long to read. She's a doctor. She's a a head doctor. (laughs) She's going to help us. (laughs) So your book focuses on the trials and tribulations in life, you know, the tiny traumas, the things that happen on a daily basis that they add up and render us in a state of overwhelm and inaction. That's what I glean. Mm-hmm. Absolutely. That is completely spot on. So tiny traumas or tiny T trauma. So what we're talking about is a lowercase T in the word trauma, as opposed to big T trauma. And we know quite a lot about big T trauma. Those are those major life events that are very significant, such as living through a natural disaster or a war zone, or being subject to a violent attack. And, and in our societies, we understand that those experiences have quite a substantial impact on our physical health as well as mental health. But what we don't really speak about nearly as much are those everyday scrapes and wounds that we gather together in life. And what they can act as is a type of psychological and emotional sludge, as it were, really blocking up our emotional arteries. And this can have a big impact. And in fact, it can actually have a bigger impact than some of the big T traumas. Let's give some examples of little Mm -hmm. T traumas so people understand what you're talking about. Because people might say, oh, wow, I I have this every day, or I don't even know what that is. Unless someone has died, I don't get what the trauma is. Mm -hmm. And that's why why it's tricky. And, And what I really noticed in my practice where clients coming in and saying that exact same thing. So nothing that bad has happened to me. I don't know why I don't feel okay. And I don't even know, Meg, why I'm in your office. And so I started to recognize some patterns. So types of tiny tea trauma are, say, growing up in a household that was not abusive by any means, but perhaps love was a bit conditional rather than being unconditional. As adults at work being um, subject to repeated microaggressions, so people being very undermining, but so subtle that they're not outright um, abusive in that sort of way that you could really put your finger on it. Also, there's so much going on in the world at the moment. So vicarious trauma, where we see very difficult events and there's not much we can do about it. So we feel helpless. 
So there are many, many types of tinity trauma, lots of issues around gaslighting. Um, I pick up a very particular one that I see quite often in terms of medical gaslighting. So going to your doctor or your health practitioner and saying, look, something's wrong or I'm in pain and really being fobbed off, but not just once, over and over again. And it really is that accumulation of these smaller traumas that build up to cause people problems. And it could be that an individual has one type of tiny T trauma or a range of tiny T traumas that lead to suboptimal mental health. This is a great, very good explanation. And I also wonder when we talk about vicarious trauma, if that also links to generational trauma, while it might not be your trauma or my trauma, but it's something that's passed down through our heritage or from generation to generation, and it's sub rosa. Yeah, absolutely, without a doubt. And what we can think about when we're thinking about trauma and the different types of trauma, first of all, all experience is valid, I would say. And there's an analogy that I use in my practice to think about how we can sort of get our heads around something that feels quite opaque and nebulous. So if we think about think about our home and our sort of electrical circuitry and say if the home was hit with a bolt of lightning now our fuse board would overheat and it would really sort of have an immediate acute impact on that circuitry now with tiny traumas if we think about it more say we've gathered up quite a few appliances and we're plugging all these appliances in and it's gradual, but the plugs are just getting overloaded and we're putting another one in, another one in, and then the fuse board, it goes again and it shorts out. But actually, it's quite hard to know exactly what it was until we really look into it. So the effects can be the same, whereas the trauma can be slightly different. What's interesting about what you're saying to me is that the brain doesn't necessarily differentiate how it responds to this, right? That you can have a big T reaction to a small T experience and vice versa, right? The brain is not, I think, as adept at discerning this, which may make it difficult to identify. Absolutely, because the brain is always looking out for threat. Yes. So to keep us safe, to keep us protected, we are naturally somewhat hypervigilant. And so the brain will react in, in the same way. And then we can actually become more hypervigilant. That can be an additional problem there too. So there's research that shows that this type of low-grade cumulative trauma can actually have a bigger impact on the individual than an acute big T type event. And when I first read that in a research study, so I was doing some research when I was still teaching full-time in academia, and that finding blew me away. So my kind of hypothesis was, both types of trauma would have an impact, but the fact that the little t, tiny t trauma had a greater impact, I thought I really must understand this. And it's because it's chronic and constant, and we don't have the opportunity to recover, to reset, and to be able to really develop those coping skills and what we call psychological immunity. This is really interesting what you've just shared. And it does make sense, right? You have a big traumatic event. You can identify, oh, this is big. This is my response to it. And in some cases, it's a delayed response, but the slow drip, right? It's the slow drip that you're talking about that keeps the cortisol level high, probably in the body too. You're in that constant state of fight or flight and there is no calm. There's no downtime. So I see how this could work. And when you see clients in your office who are in this state, how do you counsel them to reset and reboot? Mm -hmm. Again, because we do have, we do have the power, the agency to reboot, we can reset that fuse board. One incredibly important aspect of that is validation. 
So just knowing that we don't have to have this big, very, very acute trauma to explain why we feel is validating. And this is a real sort of sea change at the moment in terms of how we understand trauma. And we tend to just focus on the bigger, but more people have these sort of chronic, chronic psychological wounds that do build up over time. So in terms of when I see clients, some of the difficulties can be because they lack validation. So we start with that point that actually there is stuff here. There has been stuff going on and we can identify it. We can work with it. And then we can use some of these experiences to really build resilience so that actually you come out of it stronger. My guess would be that the resilience is already there. But the validation, the normalizing and validating, oh, yes, what you have gone through is significant and destabilizing, then gives the permission once we have the recognition, like, oh, yeah, that really is tough, that maybe we're just seen. And that's part of the medicine, right? To be seen and heard. I completely believe so, without a doubt. And and I say in my practice, when we have a discussion around tiny trauma, and I have so many people say, oh, it's a thing. It's actually a thing. It's like, yes, it is a very real thing. And sometimes that's enough, I would say, Lisa. Sometimes just the validation in itself is enough to be able to, as you say, tap into that resilience, to be able to go on and to practice very health-promoting types of behaviors and thought patterns that really bring about that type of life that is flourishing. I love that. Recognizing that it is a thing is the thing, right? Like sort of step one, acknowledging I have this, can't put my finger on it quite, talk about it, be validated. Yes, this that sounds really rough and this is a thing. And then you go, oh, okay, well now how can I move past that, you know? Mm-hmm. Without a doubt. And so I developed a three stage process to help us all to be able to move through tiny trauma, but also, as I say, to really use it. And that first stage is awareness. And I'll just give you sort of a case study example of this because it just brings it to life and to color. So I did have a client and she was incredibly, incredibly successful in all the ways that we would imagine. She had an amazing career. She had a family, but she was really reaching burnout. She was just absolutely exhausted, had quite high levels of anxiety, and she certainly needed some assistance. And we went through some of the awareness type exercises. And one of the things that really stood out was she said to me, she said, you know, Meg, when when I was a kid, if I got anything other than an A on a report card or an assignment, my parents, they would actually pin it up in the kitchen so that I would see the bad grade every single day when I was eating breakfast. And they did it out of love. It was from love. They wanted me to be the best I could be. They wanted to motivate me. But you know what? I think there's something there. And so this led to a real fear of failure. It led to maladaptive perfectionism. And to the point that when she arrived in my office, she was almost on the floor. But she felt like, well, that's not like this big thing, is it? I'm like, that's very profound, actually. Oh, this is a good story. This is a very good story. I think that's very relatable, you know, to all of us. We are going to need to take a break. And when we come back, we will continue the conversation with my guest today, Dr. Meg Errol. We're talking about her book, Tiny Traumas, When You Don't Know What's Wrong, But Nothing Feels Quite Right. To connect with Dr. Meg, please go to drmegarrell.com. And on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram, that handle is at Dr. Meg Errol. And that's A-R-R-O-L-L. Here comes the pause. We'll be right back. Wait, wait, wait. Before we take that pause, I want to mention the value of time management. Let's face it, we all want good hair days, but we're too busy to tussle with our tresses to get that frizz-free salon quality look we love. And if you're anything like me, there are not enough hours in the day to do everything that needs to get done. And that's why I've added Way's new anti-frizz cream with the signature Bondi North scent to my time-saving hair care routine. The lightweight cream provides immediate frizz control that lasts for up to 72 hours, 
Plus provides heat protection to 450 degrees while helping to reduce and repair split ends. My hair feels soft, silky smooth, and smelling like I'm on vacation. The beauty of Way's new anti-frizz cream is that my hair goes from wild to tamed in a jiff. Don't you just love that instant gratification? According to a recent user perception study, 90% of participants agreed that their hair looked less frizzy. Way offers a complete hair care solution that promotes fuller looking, healthier feeling, and happier hair for everyone. Fine, medium, or thick hair, Way has got you covered. Treat yourself to great self-care and good hair days with Way's best-selling products like their leave-in conditioner, detox shampoo, travel destination-inspired fragrances, hair oil, and hair gloss. Now you can get on your way and really mean it. Frizz free up your schedule with Way. Go to T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com and enter promo code H-H for 15% off any product. That's T-H-E-O-U-A-I dot com, promo code H-H. Now let's take that pause. We'll be right back. Research tells us that happiness is good for our health. Happy people live longer, are more productive, and make better partners, parents, and professionals. Want more sound ideas for better well-being? Check out our new bonus edition content, More Mental Fitness by Harvesting Happiness, available exclusively on Medium and Substack. One thing I know for certain, happiness waits for no one, and at times we all need a little support. To learn more about lifestyle management and mental fitness consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. And we're back. But before we get back to it, I want to talk about real life causes that impact our health. We all know that just being alive causes stress and sometimes the day to day craziness impacts our bodies. Think breakouts and thinning hairlines. Just like our skin, the condition of our hair reflects our overall health. And there are internal factors that can affect the way our hair looks, feels and grows. And that's why I use and love Nutrafol. Nutrafol is the number one dermatologist recommended hair growth supplement with over 1 million people seeing thicker, stronger, faster growing hair with less shedding. Your hair is never just about your hair and Nutrafol knows that. That's why Nutrafol takes a whole body approach to hair health, addressing the problems inside to help hair grow on the outside, supporting your lifestyle, not just your hairstyle. Nutrafol has five formulas for different lifestyles, including plant-based diets. These are tailored to what your hair needs to grow and achieve visible results in three to six months. Each physician-formulated product is drug-free and made with high-quality ingredients that are clinically tested to multi-target the key root causes of thinning, including stress, nutrition, and lifestyle. I've been using Nutrafol religiously for nearly two years. My hair is thicker and healthier because of Nutrafol, and remarkable side benefits include better sleep, improved stress response, and a significant reduction in those pesky menopause symptoms, including hot flashes. No matter your lifestyle or stage of life, Nutrafol is a great solution that targets the root causes of thinning and supports hair growth from within. Simplify your self-care with easy online purchasing. No prescriptions or doctor's visits required. Free shipping and automated deliveries ensure you'll never miss a day. Take the first step to visibly thicker, healthier hair. For a limited time, Nutrafol is offering our listeners $10 off your first month subscription and free shipping when you go to Nutrafol.com and enter the promo code HARVESTING. Nutrafol.com, spelled N-U-T-R-A-F-O-L.com, promo code HARVESTING. That's Nutrafol.com, promo code HARVESTING. Now let's get back to the conversation. And we're back continuing the conversation with my guest today, Dr. Meg Errol. We're talking about what it means to be out of sorts and on the edge. Let's get back to it. So Meg, prior to the break, we were talking about the three-step system or process that you have developed for your clients and for us, the readers, the first one being awareness. And I would love for you to finish the three so we understand that it's quite an easy process that anybody can do. It doesn't require much. No, absolutely. Anyone can do this at all. So the, the triple A, the second A in this approach is acceptance. And what I would say, Lisa, about acceptance is it's a small word, but it can be very challenging. 
And what I find mostly in my practice is that people will skip over the acceptance part, but without having that sense of acceptance, it is very difficult to, to move on. And acceptance doesn't mean resignation. It doesn't mean sort of, you know, giving in. What it really means is letting go of the internal battle with perhaps the way we think life should be and with the way it is. And once we know where we are and can accept where we are, we're so much more empowered to be able to take active steps to move towards the action phase, which is the last phase. So the acceptance, which is very challenging for many people, you know, that we so desperately want the present reality or the past event to be different than it is. And that constant fighting, right? The tension of wanting it to be different actually causes more distress than the acceptance of what is. It's kind of like those Chinese finger puppets, Mm -hmm. you know, you stick your fingers in both sides. And when you fight to try and get out, it's harder. And when you lean in, the fingers pop out. That's what comes to mind. Yeah, abs- that's exactly, exactly what it is. So it does take some sort of internal work and introspection to be able to do that. So if we think about the case study that we were talking about with the client, the acceptance piece really came around being able to accept what had happened in the past and to accept the impact it was having today. Also, to be able to accept that perfectionism perhaps could work in some aspects of life. And this client in particular, she was like, well, I'm I'm so successful because I have been perfectionistic in, in the past. But to be perfectionistic in every single situation was just so, so exhausting. So to think, OK, we can choose where we want to put that very, very sort of high standard level of energy and then let it go in other situations and be very intentional around that. So the acceptance piece as well around our our patterns that we have at the moment, they're they're open to change, but just being able to see objectively, which allows us to let go of things that no longer serve us. It does make sense in the talking through it. And yet when we're in it, it's a bit harder to, to tease it out, right? Because if if we're just feeling generally overwhelmed, tired, we've hit the wall and we don't know what to do for ourselves. And I think anybody who's listening to this will can relate to having a moment or two like that in their life. The idea of just accepting, well, this is where I'm at also is a big step that I'm even to the point of just, it's not even what happened in the past, but that I am at this, I've hit the wall. I've hit the Mm -hmm. speed bump. No, without a doubt. And it's it's a very brave step, I would say, with, without a doubt. It does take courage to be able to accept the point in life where, where we are. But by doing the sort of previous step, by working through awareness, it makes it much easier because we are able then to connect the dots. One of the biggest difficulties I see is that just not understanding why we feel the way we feel But there are always patterns and we can always make sense of this. So I see myself as a pattern finder, really, a bit of a detective. And it's so helpful because with the awareness, the acceptance actually starts to come at the same time and they overlap a bit. But really being able to say, you know what, I'm going to give up some of these patterns that are holding me back, that are exhausting me, that are affecting my relationships that is brave and it does take courage to be able to develop some new patterns that, you know what, will just allow us to reach those milestones that we want to reach. And then finally, the third step being the action. And this is where the sort of the challenge or the big test comes, right? Because we commit to change, but then actually stepping across the divide into the change can be the challenge. Yes. What I would say with this dynamic process, though, there's quite a lot of momentum by that stage. And, and oftentimes people are pretty pumped. They're like, yeah, you know <laughs> what? I, I want to do it, Meg. Let's let's do it. 
And it is around what we know so much about the daily practices, the small steps that really make the biggest difference. So just like tiny traumas can have a big impact, tiny triumphs can have a very big impact too. Yes, well said. (laughs) Integrating your triumphs into your life and really focusing in on the small things that we can enjoy and that we can build into our days, but appreciate is incredibly important the action stage though it very much is something that I sometimes see people jumping straight into action and they may be ping-ponging back from action to awareness without the acceptance but sometimes just the action without any awareness and it's a bit like having a band-aid over a deep cut so it may stem the flow a little bit but but actually we need to do some of the sort of foundational work first. Makes complete sense. We're coming to the end of our time together, and I want to talk about psychological immunity and that our mental state has its own immune system and how your work supports that. Absolutely. So we all know so much about immunity, don't we? So the psychological immune system is very much like the physical immune system. So we are born with some innate immunity, but then throughout life, we need to develop adaptive immunity. So this means that we'll be faced with some pathogens within the environment. So just like kids will pick up some colds and bugs, we kind of think, well, you know, that's that's hard. It is difficult, but actually they're developing their immune system. System. It is the same with the psychological immune system. And throughout life, we can pick up some of these emotional pathogens, as it were, psychological pathogens, and we can use them to build a strong and robust immune system. So we should really reframe our views around tiny trauma because I get asked so much how do you avoid tiny trauma we must avoid it it's like well do you know we can't avoid it in its entirety (laughs) no because life is not like that but we can recognize what it is we can recognize it has an impact and we can think okay so what kind of mechanisms can I use here to be able to use this experience for myself, for my loved ones, to build that psychological immune system? And then you're going to have really a toolkit for the rest of your life. And when other things happen in life, perhaps bigger things happen in life, you will be so tooled up that actually you'll be much more able to get through those difficult times being very much you know well intact and actually being able to see that life has so many hues and colors and that some of it can be dark a lot of it is light and it is that full picture that brings us the life that we have now So beautifully said. This has been wonderful, very informative, and I think gives listeners an idea about utilizing skills that they might not recognize that they have or that we have, but they are there and they are there as a result of these tiny traumas that life brings and that it's actually okay to have a moment of decompensation. (laughs) It might even be good for us. Mm Mm-hmm. Yes, I would absolutely agree with that. I think let's use everything we experience in life and let's be intentional and proactive about it. Yes, agreed. To learn more, please go to drmegarrell.com. We've been talking about tiny traumas when you don't know what's wrong, but nothing feels quite right. You can connect with Dr. Meg at Dr. Meg Errol, that's A-R-R-O-L-L, on Twitter, Facebook, and Instagram. Thank you so much for sharing part of your day. This is great. And it's very useful. And I I love that. I love sharing things like this. Oh, Lisa, thank you so much for today. So much for your time and so much for a great chat. I've had a complete blast. Thanks for joining us on Harvesting Happiness today. This is Lisa cypress Cayman on behalf of my guest, Dr. Meg Errol, wishing you kind thoughts, kinder words, and the kindest of actions. Until next time, remember... Happiness is an inside job. Happiness is your inside job. Please go out and rock your day and remember to be kind to one another. Want to take a deeper dive into sound ideas for better well-being? Check out our new bonus edition content, 
More Mental Fitness by Harvesting Happiness, available exclusively on Medium and Substack. Keep harvesting your own happiness anytime, anywhere from the comfort of wherever you are. Subscribe, listen, and share hundreds of downloadable episodes from wherever you get your podcasts. Connect with and follow us on most social media channels. To learn more about lifestyle management and mental fitness consulting services, please visit HarvestingHappiness.com. Harvesting Happiness and More Mental Fitness are produced by me, Lisa Cypress Kamen, Andrea Mengeli, Robin Boyd, Andrea Daly, and the awesome team at Podfly Productions, including Eric Begay, Kimberly Beck, and Alec Guess, in collaboration with TogiNet Radio, KBUU, RadioMalibu.net, and is available on PRX, the public radio exchange.